up operating today is Psalm 98. Sing a new song to the Lord, for he, is, he has performed wonders. His right hand and holy arm have won him, vic him victory. The Lord has made his victory known. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his love and faithfulness in the house of Israel. At the ends of the earth have, have seen our God's victory. Shout to the Lord, all the earth, be jubilant. Shout for joy and sing. Amen. Okay, welcome and good morning. I just want you to welcome someone around you that you didn't come to church with and just say, hey, how you going? See if they want to come down for a coffee afterwards. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Excellent to have you out. And um, yeah, I just want to back up, uh, eat, laugh, and connect. I think that's going to be a great Sunday. And uh, there's 30 of us already got our names down, and we'd love to see that at least doubled. It's just a great way to meet new people, too, and just uh, spend time over, over a meal. And um, it's not going to be a a huge event, like as in you don't have to cook an absolute feast for anybody. Uh, you take a plate with you if you go there, um, or if it's at your place, people bring food to you, and that's pretty good, isn't it? Always like it when people bring food to me. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> and if it's got meat in it, we're all good. If it's got bacon in it, then there's extra blessings inside of that too. Um, so Cafe Church tonight, and uh, again, it's our once a month service. I'm really going to encourage you again to come out tonight. Um, it just, it'll be a wonderful time in God's presence. I'm going to speak a little bit more about what I'm speaking this morning, but I really want to hear some stuff that comes back from the church. We're going to have a lot of fun in worship tonight too, so, so come on along. And uh, I'm sure it'll be an excellent evening. So 6 o'clock, we're just doing coffee and raisin toast tonight, so... Uh, that's kind of what we're looking at, uh, but then we're going to get into some great time with the Holy Spirit. I think that's about it. Okay, the message this morning. So as you know, over the last month I've been speaking through the Psalms, and particularly about finding your identity in God through the Psalms. And so the Psalms are stories, the Psalms are uh, testimonies, they are testimonies of somebody's life who has found God through a very difficult stage of life. Who here has found God through a very difficult stage of their life? Right? And your life changes, doesn't it? Because you've found him in those very difficult places. Yeah? Psalms are songs like that. Last night, uh, I had the privilege of going with Trish and, and Jake and Zach to a thing called Music on the Deck. Uh, it's one of my other pastor mates who, he's a songwriter. A few years ago, he, he, was, he received a Australian Christian Song of the Year, and, and uh, so he's just this fantastic songwriter, and I just love hanging out with him. I get inspired by listening to him, but he did, does this thing where he likes to um, empower young musicians and young songwriters, and so he opened up the back deck of his house uh, to about 25 of us or thereabouts, and we sat in the cold but with fires and, and listening uh, to the heart of a 19-year-old girl sing her songs. And uh, when he invites me to the things like that, you never know what you're going to get, okay? I don't know if I'm going to get Justin Bieber or those kind of songs. And like, she's 19, I'm 46, right? There's a big, there's a generation gap in the side, side of that. But you never know what you're going to get. But I love the heart of a guy who just goes, you know what, I want to invest in the next generation. And I, I just think that's so much of our heart of our church too. So maybe next time he's going to do it each month. So if you're keen to come along with Trish and I and the boys to something like that, it's awesome. But this girl, 19 years old, I said to her, how long have you been writing songs for? She said, 10 years. And uh, I thought, you know what, that's just amazing. I said, at the age of nine, you started writing songs. And she said, well, I started writing poems. And I found that in writing poems, all of a sudden music started connecting to that. And, and, and so we sat and listened to her music. And it was just, it was excellent. Like, it was excellent. You could have listened to it for ages. It was just such a great night. And one of the songs that really spoke to me was a song that she called My Old House. Now, I love the concept 
of home. I love the concept of church being home. I love the concept of being in my home, my family, and doing stuff at the dinner table. And when I heard her say, I've written a song about my old house from the first 12 years of my life, I knew that there was something really important that actually occurred inside of that space of her world. And so I listened up to what she had to say. And she sang this beautiful song about how she longed to be back in that home. She longed to, to feel what she felt in that home, to, to encounter the things that she encountered in that home, and just to be free to be who she was in her home. And it was excellent. Now, when she finished that song, it was just so much blessed me. I leaned across to Jake and I said to Jake, whatever motivated that story, there's something quality in this song. And as I said that, the mate who, who set this whole thing up, he, he says to this girl while she's, before she starts the next song, she goes, that was excellent. He empowers her right there. And he goes, there's something about what you've just... And she, he quotes a line that I can't remember exactly what the line was, but it's something that spoke into his heart and his world. And you can see that when she sang from that deep place of the heart, before you know it, we're actually being drawn into it. And we're actually sitting there in that place with that 19-year-old girl in the first 12 years of her life, and she is having fun. When you listen to a song like that, though, at the age of 19, to write a song where your first 12 years were that place where she longed to be back to, you know that something happened between 12 or 19 where she is desiring to be back in that place. And usually that's not the most fantastic thing in the world. I don't know what that was, but when I listened to it, I heard a song from the deep places and, and, and from where she found and desired to be back in that place of security and that place of home. For me, that revolves around Jesus. Because I found him in those deep, dark times where I feel like everyone else is walking away from you, but there is Jesus who actually wants to break into that world and see you set free from whatever it is that's been pushing you down. My old house. I love it. Every one of us here have got a song that goes on inside of them and for so many of us, we think we're not musical or we think we don't have a very good voice or we can't sing, we can't play, we can't do the things like that. And we actually lose the melody of the song that is happening within us. And if we keep on doing that and keep putting ourselves down and losing our identity, it becomes this sad old story rather than this great song that actually occurs within us. And I think so often the devil steals from us the joy of our salvation to leave us with what? So you look at, it, you look at it, a world that we've just gone through and, and England leaves the, the, the EU and you see reverberations that happen and the fear mongers want to say all kinds of things. Now I'm not there, I don't know really what that means. Graham would probably be able to get up here and give us a better understanding of what it means for Great Britain to leave uh, the, the EU and all that kind of stuff. But you feel the fear that reverberates and before you know it that fear starts working on our song and starts stealing the joy from our song. And so when we see things like that happen in the world, the first thing that shakes, it seems to shake, is our money. What's going to happen? Is there going to be a recession? And all of a sudden we start realising what fear is actually attacking. And before you know it, our song no longer is this great praise to God, but it's this great fearful statement of what's going to happen next. Now, over the last month, I've been bouncing off two particular people in Scripture. In Luke chapter 17 and 18, you've got a story about the rich man who is a Pharisee who comes to Jesus and asks him, what must I do to get eternal life? And you've also got another rich man by the name of Zacchaeus, and he's come to Jesus too. And both of these guys have got songs that are going on inside of their life. So the Pharisee comes to Jesus and he says to Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, well, how are you going with the Ten Commandments, brother? And he's ticking them off. I've done them. Since I've been a child, I, I, I'm not an adulterer, I'm not a murderer, I'm not a stealer, I don't envy, I don't covet, I, don't, I honour my mother and father. I've been doing all of these things. And Jesus says to him, but there's still one thing you lack, brother. All these things are doing in your own strength. But if you want eternal life, you've got to walk in a place of faith. 
And in this particular guy's story, his song revolved around his money and his identity. And when Jesus said, listen, you've got to leave that behind you, his song sounded kind of different. The Bible says he walked away in tears. Zacchaeus' story is somewhat different. So Zacchaeus, again, he's interested and he comes to Jesus and he tries to see Jesus. And you know the story, he can't find him or he can't see him because he's too short. So he climbs a tree to look for him. And before you know it, there's Jesus standing at the bottom of the place of the tree and he's calling Zacchaeus down to say, brother, I want to have dinner, dinner with you. And the same conversation would probably happen at the dinner table. And there is Jesus leading Zacchaeus into a place of, do you want to believe and have faith, Zacchaeus? Because if you do, Zacchaeus, the things that are controlling you, the things that this fear that surrounds you or the identity that you have in your money has got to stay behind you. And Zacchaeus, we know of his story, he actually responds in faith. And the Bible says he comes out of his house and he starts rejoicing. He's rejoicing to the point where people are going, what on earth is going on with this guy? We know who this guy is. We've seen his past. We understand his past. This guy is not a very good guy. Jesus, what are you doing even having dinner with him? You're actually honouring him by doing that. And Jesus goes, it makes no difference as to whether I talk with a Pharisee or whether I talk with a tax collector. The same message is going to pour out of him. And he's calling them into faith. He's calling them into life. One guy had his book ticked of all the things he believed he had to do to live a good life. The other man was collecting all the money he needed to collect to make sure that he had a good life. But in both stories, Jesus comes to them both and says, I've got a new song to sing. A new song to sing. One song with the Pharisee sort of has this, he goes away in tears. And the other song, the Bible says he rejoices. You know, when we sing songs and some of these songs that we've been doing today, uh, and the one we're going to finish the service with, we're going to finish the service with Mountain, there's a bridge section to most songs that we do. And if you don't know anything about music, let me just briefly explain it to you. Usually you've got a verse and you've got a chorus and you cycle between the two. And you might have two verses or three verses. Or if you're a long-time Baptist, some of them have 15 verses, right? I remember when I was a kid and I was at church at Lee Cumbrella Baptist Church and, I, and my father said open up to 622 and I opened up and it was about eight verses and it was played so slow I'm thinking this is going to be longer than the message. So you've got a verse and you've got a chorus but in a lot of songs we do they have a bridge and a bridge is usually this crescendo part that you come into to declare something so massive and so mighty. And so when we sing Mountain at the end of this service, you'll hear the holy, holy, holies, and you know what I'm talking about. It's this part of a song that actually changes it and changes it up, and we use it as a dynamic shift. You'll hear that happen inside the musicians, a dynamic shift up. You'll hear it in the drums, yeah? Amen? Amen. Love the drums. Love the one who plays the drums. Love the one who plays the guitar there too, right? Yeah? Is that cool? Just because they're my boys. I actually love the one who led worship. That's Colin. He's not even related to me other than through the blood of Jesus. I love Bethany. She's just an awesome singer on the planet. I just really think she's, there's so much ahead of her. I love Victor who's on the keys. I love Craig. Who loves Craig? Yeah. I love Michael on the sound over there and we're just connected by the blood of Jesus as well and you've got these guys down the front here just serving God. And what about the guys who did communion this morning? No, sorry, offering. <laughs> and how happy are we to see Lisa here? She has a groove inside of her that she's going to bless you guys week after week. I am certain and sure of it. But this is the thing, right? We're connected by the blood of Jesus. And all these things work together to create this bridge that we actually sing together as a church. It's the same deal with our story. So you got a verse one where your song started, and you got a verse two where your where your life actually kicks into some sort of gear, and then you got a chorus of something just standard about your life. Okay, this is what I'm declaring about my life, and for many Christians, this is what I declare about God. But you got a bridge. And a bridge is one of these moments when God or Jesus actually intersects your life and shows to you something of who he is, which usually surprises you. Surprises you. And I love it. 
I love it. So often when we look at the news and we read about the church and we, under, we think what the church is about and the condemnation often that people experience, I love it when people actually experience the love of Jesus for the very first time. And it doesn't matter if you're a Pharisee or it doesn't matter if you're a tax collector. It doesn't matter if you're a refugee. It doesn't matter if you're a First Fleet Australian. It doesn't matter. Like just Jesus just wants to infect your life. And this is the story that we see here today. That it doesn't matter if you've been a Pharisee your entire life or you've been born into the place of understanding the word of God or you're a tax collector that you've just heard something about Jesus and you're actually keen to know. Jesus is keen to meet you exactly where you are. Exactly where you are. And so we have two different songs. And the first song that of this, this Pharisee comes away crying and his bridge would sound something like this can't believe what he's asked me to do. It's too much. I spent my whole life working for this and he's told me to follow something else. It's just too much. And he walks away in tears. Zacchaeus bridge is somewhat different because here's a guy and I don't know if you grow up planning to be a tax collector I don't know if that's a, something as your son, your father was or your grandfather was, so you are. Maybe it is. Probably in those days, definitely it probably was. And so Zacchaeus might have been born into a place of being a tax collector. And so he was born into a place where people actually despised him. You ever been despised by somebody? It doesn't feel pleasant, does it? It changes your song, right? It changes who you are if you keep listening. And see, so Zacchaeus. And so it might have been generational that he's been a tax collector and generational that he's actually been hated. And, and there he is up a tree and Jesus stops and says to him and invites him into exactly the same place to the guy who's been doing everything supposedly right for his entire life. Now, in the eyes of the world, the guy who's been doing everything his entire life, you think, well, surely that's got to count for something. And Jesus going, that's really cool that you're doing all that. But what I'm interested in, and if you're interested in it, I want you to, he's calling him to follow. And it's the same with Zacchaeus. It would seem that Zacchaeus has been stealing money his whole life. And so there was none of those boxes that he's probably actually ticking off. Maybe he honoured his mother and father. Maybe he didn't covet his neighbor's wife. I don't know. But there is Jesus asking exactly the same question to both people. And Zacchaeus' song would sound something like this. I was once controlled by what I had. But now I have found life in one who ate with me. Once I, I felt the guilt and the shame of all that I have done. But he has forgiven me. He has not shamed me. He has lifted me. He has not guilted me. He has called me into family. Once I felt alone. But now I know I'm never alone. Now which song would you like to sing out of those two songs? Which is your bridge? What is the song that's going on inside of your world right now that if Jesus interjects it, if Jesus comes into it, what is it that's going to change inside of your world? What's that going to look like? What is that going to sound like? Are you with me today? Being musical, I love musical analogies, right? And when you talk with people and they say, I can't sing a note, that's not true. You can sing a note. Is it the right note? I sang about 50 notes this morning that weren't the right note. Anyone pick up on that? <laughs> Pam did. I don't feel any guilt or shame over that, Pam. I encourage people just to sing, right? from the heart, from the place where Jesus meets us, where he meets you. And I discover in that something so freeing and liberating. Jesus in uh, 
If you've got your Bibles, open up to, to John chapter 14. And Jesus is signing off with his disciples before he goes to the cross. And he says this in verse 30, I won't speak with you much longer for the ruler of this dark world or the devil, if that's what you call him or Satan, the ruler of this dark world is coming, but he has no power over me. Do you like that, Jesus saying that? Satan has no power over him. Who's up for that? You don't have to be Jesus for that phrase to resonate with you. He has no power of me for he has nothing to use against me. Now, Jesus is perfect. He never sinned and nobody thinks he's got anything to use against him. But in our world where we, are, we know that we've fallen, we know that we've screwed up, we know that there's many things that we're ashamed of doing, we always think that Satan has something against us, don't we? And even in my world, I know that Satan has this habit of just reminding me of my past to say, you know, you haven't forgotten that, have you, Matt? You haven't forgotten all that stuff back then. And what I find is I'm listening to the wrong voice. Because I have Jesus who declares over me that saying through his blood, through what he has done, Satan now has nothing to use against me, which means he has nothing to control me with. Not fear, not condemnation, not guilt, not shame. He has nothing to control me with. Now, if you go to the next chapter in, in John chapter 15, Jesus actually gets in his, he starts telling a story and he says, I'm like a sprouting vine and the farmer who tends the vine is my father. He cares for the branches connected to me by lifting and propping up the fruitless branches and pruning every fruitful branch to yield a greater harvest. The words I have spoken over you, Jesus says, have already cleansed you. The words that he has spoken over you have already forgiven you. Satan has nothing to use against you because of what Jesus has spoken over you. Who here wants to hear today over you that you are forgiven? Okay? Know it that's already occurred and it's come out of the voice of Jesus, not just out of the voice of Matt. He has cleansed you. He has washed you. He has wiped all of that stuff away. To the Apostle Peter, he says, I'm not, I'm not about washing the whole body. I'm just about washing the feet, right? And that means he's just going, in this world, occasionally you're going to get dirty on the part that connects you with the world. But he wants to declare over you that he has cleansed you, that he has forgiven you, and that he's calling you now to a path of faith that looks like restoration. You know, in my story of life is this. Faith always provides me a path to restoration. I sat with this phrase in my brain all week. I wrote it down and put it on my desk. And I just think, is this true? That faith always leads me to a path of restoration. And I sat with it day after day. and said, Father, is this something that is truth in my life? Because I kept thinking of my circumstances at time, which looked like, is this actually restoration? Or am I just more enduring stuff right now? What is this looking like, Lord? And then each day went past. He's saying, you're talking about faith. You're talking about what you cannot yet see. And if you're walking down a path of faith, God has something in store for you that's going to look something like you're going to be restored which means that Satan no longer has anything to use against you, which means that fear no longer has the ability or the right to control you, which means that shame no longer can knock at your door because you have been forgiven. Does that sound like a song to you? Does that sound like a message that could actually start flowing in your life? Last, last week, Seamus came up to me after the service and he said, Matt, you've got to stop speaking these positive messages because I keep walking out of here feeling so good about myself and the world wants to tell me how bad I am. Well, I just want to tell you what God sees of you. I don't care what the world sees of you. I just want to tell you what God sees of you. And God sees inside of you his divine nature. God sees inside of you a person who's created in his very image. God sees inside of you a person that he's planted eternity deep down in that space. God sees inside of you his mind that has been transformed and making you into the mind of Christ. God sees in you a masterpiece. God sees in you a new creation. Does any of those words sound like guilt or shame to you? None? That's just the Bible. 
that's just the Bible. And when I hear of people come and sit with me and they hear of the guilt and the shame that the church has placed on them, I know that's not the Bible. That's just somebody is judging somebody and speaking words over somebody that they were never called to speak words over because Jesus said it's not our job to judge, it's just our job to love, right? Isn't that right? It's not our job to judge. It's our job to love. And there is Jesus. You've got a Pharisee and you've got a tax collector and the world is judging them both. The, the Pharisee, the world goes, that guy's awesome. He's doing all the right things. To the, to the tax collector, that guy is just despicable. He does all the wrong things and Jesus goes, no, I just see two humans. I just love them both. What would the church look like if that just became common? In, when I say the church, I mean the church. Would that just open up doors for you? Just to speak words of love and life rather than condemnation and guilt and, and shame? The psalm that Pam read to you this morning is a psalm of victory. It's a psalm of overcoming a difficult time. It's very hard to sing a song of victory if you had nothing to be victorious over. And so what was Zacchaeus' victory? That he listened to Jesus for who Jesus is, not what the world wants to tell you that Jesus is. He listened to the message of Jesus and he walked away from his old life and embraced a new life. You know what we don't know about Zacchaeus? We don't know if he left his tax collecting behind him. He might have still been a tax collector. But maybe he's a tax collector that was fueled by love rather than guilt. Oh, sorry, greed. What would that look like? When Zacchaeus came to Jesus, he hoped to encounter him. When he met him at the table, he could not help but encounter him. And there is Zacchaeus who responds to an invitation just to have dinner with Jesus. At that table, he is victorious over guilt and shame. Over that table, he is victorious over greed and envy. At that table, he is victorious because he walks and follows after Jesus and discovers a path of restoration. The first step down that path of restoration for him was people trying to put guilt and shame back on him. Do you hear that in the scripture? It's not what people say about you that should make the difference. It's the way that God feels about you that should change and transform your life. So if, you've if you are tired of being labelled by the world, start being labelled by Jesus. And you will not be placed in guilt or shame rather that you'll find a place of life, of fullness, of abundance, as the Bible calls it, of knowing who you are in Jesus. You remember a month ago I shared with you that phrase, God is who he says he is, and you are who God says you are. I am not who the world tells me I am. I am who God says I am. My bridge my song talks about restoration. My bridge, my song talks about being utterly lost in guilt and shame, but finding something in Jesus that has transformed and changed my life. That is my bridge and that is my song. And when people want to come and sit with me, that's what they hear. When, when they hear my song, which is my story or my psalm or my parable, whatever you want to call that is in Scripture, what comes out of me is what God has done inside of me. And I want to be in a place like Zacchaeus is where I continue to walk into a place of faith and restoration and transformation rather than walking away from Jesus in a place of tears because he's, I feel like he's asking me too much. All he's asking is for you to trust him and follow him and let him deal with the details. And before you know it, you'll be singing your own song and putting your own words to what transformation actually 
looks like. I've heard people say to me at times, I want what you've got, and I say, well, I reckon what you've got is gonna, it, it's just as good as what I've got, but you've just got to work out what that song actually looks like. Because my restoration, my transformation is just my story. What God is doing in your life is so profound that you'll be like Zacchaeus, where you'll have no issue in following after the one who has invited you, called you, loved you, forgiven you, cleansed you, and set you free. Are you ready to sing a bridge? Let's have the worship team come on down and I'm just going to pray. So Father in heaven, we thank you for the song that is in each person's heart here. And I don't know, but I'm, I was like many people who just find I just don't even want to sing that song because I just don't even know if that's a place that you would just open to me. But Jesus, I know when I just opened my voice all those years ago, you met me at that table. Well, first of all, you called me out of a tree. You met me at a table. And you started a work that is ongoing. You started a song that has still been written. You started a journey, Lord, that just ends with you in heaven and glory. And what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, I believe in faith. I've already inherited that. So I'm walking into that destiny of eternity. But in the meantime, Father, continue the work that you have begun. And I pray that for each person here, that wherever we are in our faith walk or our faith journey, or even if we're even yet to start it, that this day might be a day in faith where we are called to follow and maybe the words of hope start becoming the very things of the bridge that is occurring within us. The words of transformation and restoration, the words of grace. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, is that a bridge? Yeah. Father, this morning, we just desire for our song to be something, Lord Jesus, that looks like transformation. And Father, the beautiful thing is that is what you promise. That is what you promise. And so, Father, we know that you are good for your word. We know, Father, that you are here. And so, Father, I pray that this morning that you'll come and meet people at their table. Call them out of the trees, Father, to find you, and discover you. Father, we thank you that you are the one who is working all things together for glory. You are the one who is changing lives. You are the one who is transforming. We call you holy, Father. And we join with the angels to declare you holy, holy, holy. Amen.